The other day I was talking with someone about math and grammar and he totally thought plus was a verb. Well, it's not. Add is the verb. You can also use some that way. Plus is a conjunction when you use it like and. Plus, it is also an adjective meaning positive as in plus one versus minus one. And in terms like five plus six, it is a preposition. Kids don't learn much grammar these days, not in school, not even the basics, the parts of speech. Who can tell the difference between a noun and a pronoun anymore? Funny thing about nouns is that any noun could be used to refer to anyone or anything. Like for example, Prince changed his name to a newly invented symbol. And there's a band, uh, The Who, that named after the interrogative pronoun. Which brings to mind the Abbott and Costello routine, uh, who's on first. In the context of a name, who transmogrifies from a pronoun into a proper noun. Stranger still, there's a band called The The. So any word can be used as a noun if it happens to be a name for someone or something. The distinguishing, the distinguishing convention is to capitalize names, but this is not universal. A pet name for a lover, for example, might be uncapitalized. So then, if any word, pronouns included, can be used as a name, a regular noun, how can we ever be sure if we are reading or hearing a pronoun and not a name? A man, or, or these days a woman, could be commonly known by the name he, capitalized or not. And perhaps he, he or she also goes by the name him, obfuscating the grammar. But there's one small category which is immune from such naming shenanigans. This is the possessive pronouns. In English, the possessive form of a noun must always end with an apostrophe, usually followed by an S, except for the short list of possessive pronouns and pronominal adjectives, my, mine, our, ours, thy, thine, your, yours, his, her, hers, its, their, theirs, and whose. Because of the exception to the apostrophe rule, its, I-T-S, with or without an apostrophe is one of the most ubiquitous errors in English writing. Supposing someone officially had the name my, M-Y, all the other pronoun confusion aside, the possessive form would unambiguously be my's, M-Y, apostrophe S. But wait, you say, what if we invent brand new pronouns, complete with new possessive forms? We can't do that, sorry. But isn't that exactly what people have been doing over the past several years? No, they haven't. <laughs> Although they imagine they have. What they've actually invented are just plain nouns, names. And every time they use one of these names in the possessive form without an apostrophe, they are objectively wrong. And since this apostrophe is the only definitive way to distinguish a pronoun from a noun, it is unsurprising that no one has noticed. <laughs> Why though? New words are invented all the time. Verbs, adjectives, nouns. What makes pronouns exceptional? To be perfectly clear, consider Merriam-Webster's definition. Any of a small set of words such as I, she, he, you, it, we, or they in a language that are used as substitutes for nouns or noun phrases and whose referents are named or understood in the context. Compare this with the definition of name, a word or phrase that constitutes the distinctive designation of a person or thing. The confusion here comes from the layer of language abstraction. A thing in the world is not a word, nor is the thing its name, but it's the entire purpose of language is to function as if it were. For example, he is Sue is understood to be linguistically equivalent to his name is Sue, whereas the statement he is his name confuses the layers of abstraction. This is because there are implicit quotation marks in his name is quote Sue. Adding this touch of syntax formally distinguishes the word itself from its referent. Normally we process these layers without thinking unless the distinction is highlighted, like in the anomaly, his, he is his name. 
We know obviously that a name is a word and that a word is not the same as its referent. In mathematical terminology, a pronoun is a variable. Any word which may fall under the scope of a pronoun is a noun. There are several kinds of pronouns, such as indefinite pronouns like somebody, nothing, s someone, everyone. These are impersonal and hence uncontroversial, whereas personal pronouns are, well, personal. Of course, in, in any, any instance of language, if, if it is the reader's choice to take it personally, personally or not, and likewise it is the writer's choice to intend it personally or not. Due to the inherent structure of personal pronouns, there are precisely three ways to use them offensively. Number one, he or she versus it. 1a, calling someone it is at best diminutive and at worst pejorative. 1b, the reversal, however, is not an issue, as a thing is incapable of taking offense. Calling something he or she does not directly insult anyone. Number two, he or she versus they. 2a, Sam looked at themselves in the mirror and saw their eyes looking back at them. Though this confused approach has become extremely popular, it is obviously a phenomenal mismatch. Unless we interpret Sam as a group of multiple people. Even so, themself is itself a fallacy in either context. There is no reflexive pronoun themselves. Sorry, it's just wrong. The last resort would be to interpret themselves and them as names for Sam, in which case their eyes would instead be them's eyes, themselves' eyes, Sam's eyes, or simply his eyes or her eyes, or, or possibly even its eyes if, uh, for example, Sam is a machine with vision simula simulating sensors. To be, I told the boys that he needs to put down his phones and listen to me. Notice that this is the exact same fallacy, just with the plurality reversed. It's clearly wrong because it would indicate that he is either separate from the boys or just one of the boys. Nobody is arguing for such a case of a singular pronoun standing for the plurality. Yet, when the roles are reversed, we are told to abandon concise grammar for the sake of certain political and identitarian ideologies? Well, lastly, the big one, number three, he versus she. For those of us who have made it past grade school, the childish insult of calling someone by their the opposite pronoun shouldn't arouse too much beyond perhaps a smirk and an eye roll. But it's the current year, and pettiness is now a competitive sport. Yes, indeed, the slippery slope of common usage has come a long way. All in the name of progress. Traditionally, going all the way back to Latin roots, in practice, sometimes a masculine pronoun potentially includes in its scope one or more feminine reference. Then in recent history, a narrative developed that this practice is harmful and oppressing women. He or she and he slash she were the obvious corrective actions. But many complained that this approach was overly cumbersome. Kind of makes you just want to pick one and go with it, right? And from here, the big transition initiated from one pronominal mismatch to another. Instead of oppressing women by overstepping the logical scope of masculine pronouns, we can overstep the logical scope of they by using it to include everyone individually, thereby stripping us all of both our masculinity and our femininity and oppressing everyone equally. But the oppression doesn't stop there. Diving deep into the depths of hell, People, with, minimally with minimal comprehension of what pronouns actually are and how they operate within a coherent grammar, concocted the ingenious idea to redefine what a pronoun is, making it indistinguishable from a name. This way, we're all free to choose our own pronouns, the same way we can choose usernames for our online personas. 
just with a little extra mental gymnastics and a false pretense of grammatical consistency. Now everyone is empowered to claim victimhood whenever the wrong pronoun is used, especially if no offense is intended. Still, even after having jumped off the cliff altogether into total insanity, we need to go one step further. With everyone hyper-focused on the masculine, feminine, neuter, he, she, it divide, we have overlooked the equally oppressive, pronominal issue of number. While those of us who identify as a singular man or woman are represented by he or she, and those who identify as a plurality are represented by they, there is still no personal pronoun for someone who identifies as non-existent. To correct this outrageous hate crime, I hereby coin the term nil pronouns. Z, subject, zer, object, and most importantly, zers, possessive sans apostrophe. Z will have zero issues adopting and teaching zer pronouns because they are as easy as she, hers, hers. But with a Z, as in zero, further affirming zer identity as non-existent. Now that you've been educated, you can do your part in fighting existential supremacy by acknowledging zer non-existence as stunning and brave. Always be mindful of Zer right not to exist, and most importantly, writhe in guilt and shame for what you and your ancestors have perpetuated over countless generations, because that's how equity works.